Okay, so um, Michal Avona has gained weight. Like one of the um, the fact that her growth is on her hypothalamus, it's sitting on a lot of the hormones that that regulate like growth and eating and sleeping and and sight. And from when she was born, like she wasn't eating a lot, which is why she didn't gain weight, which is how we figured out finally that, you know, the doctors figured out that this is, that she has a growth and um, they, and, and because she has a slow growing glioma, the doctors hope they don't know much about it. Like they keep on saying it's more of a mystery than is known about it because you don't know how the body's going to react to it and exactly where it sits and how fast the glioma is going to grow and not grow. So they, they, they are very honest and they say more is of a mystery than what is known. And, but the one thing that they do say is that she needs to gain weight and she wasn't gaining weight through the pipe in her nose. So they put a peg in her stomach and now she is being fed through her peg 24 seven there's Malka's milk dripping into her and the milk is enriched because they want the caloric intake. The reason they took it, they took the, um, the, the nose feeding is because she was not gaining weight with that. And they wanted the food to go directly into her, into her intestine. So thank God she started to gain weight. She went up like in the past week, one pound, which is incredible amount. And you know, we're hoping she's going to hold on to it. The doctors say that her body responds to the growth as if it's running a marathon the whole entire time and it's burning up a lot of calories, which is why she's taking in about double the calories that a, um, a regular child her age is taking. And um, also, I think that they, they, they're hoping that as she grows, and the glioma is not going to grow at a certain point, it'll just swallow itself in to her body. But I also feel that because more of it is mysterious than not, there's a lot of room for Hashem to, to create miracles over here. And because she's being fed 24 seven in, in a very slow drip of Malka's food. So Malka couldn't produce enough milk. And then when she, the baby, when Michaela Vona gets the formula, so she was throwing it up. It was it was too much for her. So we decided, let's ask if there are any mothers that are willing to donate the milk. Like there's a milk bank in Israel, but we wanted to find women that we know, that we could trust, that because Michal is on chemotherapy once a week. So, you know, it has to be known that the woman is very meticulous and very sterile, et cetera. So we put the whole story on Facebook in Tel Aviv, just like a closed mother's Facebook that Tal has access to. And literally within seconds, we got a barrage of women saying, we'll do anything you need, anything you want. We'll sterilize, you know, come and see how we do it. And we'll bring the milk every day for her um, to the hospital. They were so open and willing because when Malka doesn't have enough milk and the formula is given, it's, she throws it up. Um, at the end of the day, um, Malka's nursing there's in the hospital, there's like the main nursing um, expert plus the physical therapist. Like she's a physical therapist, nurse, nursing expert. She told Malka that her body, when Michal Levona's mouth is on her breast, um, her body creates the kind of milk that has antibodies specifically for Michal Levona and what she eats. So she suggested to Malka, instead of getting milk from someone else, to um, just up her pumping, pump every two, three hours, pump every three hours, and then 10 minutes in the middle, like every hour and a half for 10 minutes and every three hours for like a half hour and up your milk supply because, because the milk supply is what's going to give the baby the strength to withstand um, the chemotherapy. So I just wanted to say that I felt so blessed to be part of Am Yisrael where everyone around just incessantly is doing chasadim over here is trying to help is trying to give everything that they can so 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 now michal has gained weight they might be releasing her for shabbat um we're hoping it's going to continue another thing happened is that um that this is also mysterious 
and and we're just trying to see how it's going to go is that she has a shunt in her that was put in by her brain that has a pipe directly into her intestines and um and all her uh, the the look the fluids are is supposed to drain from her brain straight into her intestines they found out like sunday that um the fluids were not draining and they thought something was wrong with the shunt so they had a mini operation they checked it out and it turns out that the shunt is okay and they didn't they don't know why it's not draining um they ended up taking two test tubes like they drained out two test tubes of fluids from her head so we want to also see that that fluids are not going to um they're not going to uh accumulate because it's you know, it, 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 you can't function that way. Once the fluids were drained out, she was ha like happy and playful and singing and talking. Um, she has a really great kind of personality, laid back, easygoing, very, very happy. So Malka knew something was wrong when she just started sleeping the whole time. She started sleeping the whole time and she like stopped being playful. She just went into a sleep and that's how she knew that something was wrong. So Malka is trying to trust her intuition a lot. So we're continuing to pray and I'm thanking everyone that is praying and, and continue to hope for miracles and to know that it is a total, totally and utterly in God's hands. It is in his hands in no one else's hands other than him um two things so first i went to an alternative doctor it's he's also a doctor that's um um that's conventional he's like in the regular medical system in israel but he also has like holistic kind of herbs and things like that my husband and i went to him and he saw me olive onaz a video of her because he needed to see how she is and then he was able to write out according to, you know, reading her charts about what he thinks she should be taking, what kind of extracts and roots and things like that. And um, I gave it to Malka and Or, and I really needed to create a fence between me and Malka. And we're going to talk about creating fence today, creating fences and bringing God in, into our life. I needed to create a fence between me and Malka because I needed to say, I want to go to this doctor because I would like to hear what he has to say. However, whatever he has to say in any of his recommendations, I'm putting it at Malka's doorsteps and at Orr's doorsteps. And it's up to them if they will take it or not. Actually, till now, they haven't done anything with it. And I stop myself every day from, you know, questioning and asking, you know, did you call, like um, her husband said, um, he wants the oncologist to approve of everything. And, and they haven't been able to, you know, see the oncologist for long periods of time. And every time they saw her, they spoke about Michal and not really about the holistic. So I really need to build this kind of fence between me and my daughter. A fence, not, you know, you, I don't want to be around you and I don't want you to come to, but a fence knowing that I'm not going to become enmeshed with my daughter, that I'm going to allow her the dignity to make decisions about her own daughter. Um, trust her that she knows what's good for her daughter, she and her husband. Trust that Hashem put this little girl in their hands because this is where she needs to be. This is where she, this little girl needs. I don't want to call her a little girl. Someone told me, don't call her little, call her big. This sweet, growing Michali is, you know, needed to be with her to grow, to, you know, to, to teach us what we need to learn for her to go through this journey. And um, and th that's something that I'm really proud of, like my ability to create this kind of giving my daughter and son-in-law respect to, and not constantly asking, and, and did you do, and did you give, and did you ask, and what are you going to do, and why not, and you know, all this water is accumulating, and this holistic doctor said that this is going to dry up the water, why don't you try it, why don't you try it, like, no. I could give you what I found out and now it's up to you to do it. And I'm not going to break down that fence. I'm not going to break down the fence. Um, okay. I want to now talk about an avodah that I'm doing. And and I called up Michal Peretz because I wanted to, um, 
um, because I, I didn't know what to do with it. And I have to say that since I've been doing the avodah, like the situation really became, um, um, the, the situation became much better. So two things. One, every morning when I wake up, I wake up and I, with a lot of heart palpitations, which indicates anxiety. And I find that throughout the day, my heart doesn't stop beating fast as if I'm running a marathon. And the only time it stops is when I'm in the hospital with Michal Levona. Then I'm able to like, my heart is able to calm down. But I realized that living with heart palpitations the whole time is not the best way to be. Plus, I realized that once a week, like my herpes erupts. I have a small eruption of herpes, which is a very big indicator of stress. And I spoke to Michal about it. And she asked me, like, what is your anxiety about? And I said, you want to honestly know what? My anxiety is about, I want to know what's going to happen. I like, you know, there's some women, like, let's say they're going out and not getting married and they're anxiety ridden about it. And they always say, if someone will tell me that at 35, I'll get married and have a baby, I'm going to go and have a good time. So, so same over here, I was thinking to myself, if, if I could just know that everything is going to be okay, or God forbid the other way, right? I, I'll make my peace with it either way, but I just want to know what's going to happen. And at the basis of it was, I want to know how it will all end. What will it look like? And it's a very big issue. And what, what did that teach me about myself? That I want to be in control. But that kind of control of trying to like take all the steps to have everything work out perfectly, it's all an illusion. Our life, nothing is in control. Life is so fragile, so, so fragile. We, we have no control even when we think that we do have control. And, and Michal was telling me that our mission in life and, and mine particularly now, but every single woman's mission in life is to wake up in the morning and tell Hashem that we want to walk with him every day. I want to wake up and ask myself, what's my mission today? How do I bring all the good that I have in this world? How do I bring it into to fruition? And then go ahead and do it and not think about and what's going to happen tomorrow and the next month and how are we going to do it and what is going to be and and, you know, even not thinking about next week. Oh, my God, Sunday, she needs chemo. How's Malka going to get there? And, and there's traffic. And what time is she going to leave? And all those things. Like, like just waking up this morning and asking myself, what's my shalichut? What's my mission of, for today? And I say, today, I would like to spend the day with Michal Levona in the hospital, um, sleep the night there so Malka can have a night, stay there Friday morning, and and we come home 12 o'clock to start cooking for Shabbat. And that's, that's, that's what I want to do. Or go to Malka's house and babysit for the kids and take care of them and cook for them and make sure the house is clean. That's what I want to do today. Now, once I say what I want to do, what my mission is, what my shalichut is, shalichut is like Moshe Rabbeinu, God send him on a shalichut, God send him on a mission to go free the Jewish people. And, and as he was going through the mission, Every day, God told him, like, this is this is what you're going to do today. Today, there's going to be blood in the, you know, and, and tomorrow there's going to be frogs. And it, it, they took it day by day. So when I am able to stay in the present with Hashem, I walk with him hand in hand. I wake up and ask myself, what is my shalichu today? How could I bring my tov into this world today? And live this day holding his hands doing exactly what I want to, to, to do. And, and basically my description as a grandmother who is who has a, a granddaughter with a growth is every day I ask my daughter and her son, I'm here to serve. What would you like me to do? Unless it's a day that I want to go see my mother. So then I go to my mother and I don't say, you know, I'm here to serve. What would you like me to do? Also, another thing is uh, that, sorry, I'm eating a pomegranate. Um, another thing is that I pray to Hashem that I don't have to take what the doctors say seriously. What does that mean? It means that there are a lot of assumptions of what's happening. 
but the doctors don't know everything. And even in this situation where so much is mysterious, we usually get the worst case scenarios. They're allowed to say what they want, but I need to really know bottom line that it is in God's hands. It's not because they said it, it's going to happen, which is why I don't run and, and read on Google, you know, what is, you know, this syndrome, the anaphylactic syndrome that she has, what does it mean? And, you know, what are the side effects and, you know, what are the, like, I don't have to, because it, these are just information that's out there. that's trying to prepare me for the worst. And I don't necessarily have to think of the worst. I want to take every day at a time and be able to thank Hashem for the day and be able to pray more for every day what I'd like to have. So the doctors are allowed to say what they want, but it's up to God what will happen. And I'm trying to hold in my head the vision of Michal running on the beach, playing with her siblings, swimming with them, dancing with her at a wedding, um, being able, like Michali being... Um, uh, stubborn and not wanting to do different things and not wanting to go to sleep and just wanting to stay up and just having this regular, normal, rambunctious childhood. And that's what I keep in my head. That is what I keep in my head. So just like in a 20 minute synopsis of, you know, where I am and, and how, um, how I've been, I also want to say something else. Um, yesterday, Malka, I have a friend who's like a gourmet health cook. Um, she she cooks unbelievable. And Malka told me, you know, her name is Elat. And Malka asked me, do you mind asking Elat if she could cook me like a meal when I'm in the hospital? It's because it gets very um, tiring eating food from the cafeteria or just even a food from a restaurant, it's just feels like it's mass produced. So she asked, you know, could Ayla cook for me? I have, I've been hardly cooking between, you know, the kids and Malka, the baby, the house. Like I have, I haven't really cooked much. And um, so I told Ayla that I was going to come and pick up the food from Ayla. It was like happily I'll cook. Like she made almond crusted salmon and wild rice salad, like really the yummiest ever. And sourdough bread that she sprouted. Anyway, I go pick up this huge bag at seven o'clock and I go give it to Malka and Malka sits down and she's eating and she's pumping and it's like by then it's nine o'clock and and I see that she's really tired. So I told her, Malka, go, the nights are, because Michal Levona is fed 24-7, oh my God, when am I going to start the class? But because she's fed 24-7, it's hard, it's hard to lay her down because she throws up the food and we don't want her to throw up because we want her to gain weight. So she's held most of the time upright, even at night, she's held upright so she won't vomit. So um, so I told, and, and, and nights are just busy. Like they come, they take blood, they add, you know, different things that are missing from her blood. Um, they, you know, we're, we're constantly having the food running through her. So every hundred milligrams we change, we wash, we this, we that. I told Malka, go to sleep and I'll be here. I thought to myself, I'll be here two, three hours and then I'll wake Malka up and she'll finish the night. Um, anyway, Malka went to sleep and the hours went by and I couldn't wake Malka up because because um, uh, she was really tired and I wanted her to sleep. Now, there were two ways for me to think as I was there. One, I could have thought to myself, Malka needs to sleep. Why am I the one here, the whole, like holding Michal Avona and making sure that she's sleeping? Why isn't this one or that one? Why, why am I the one here? And I could be resentful about it. Or I could say to myself, God has many messengers to take care of Malka. I'm not the only one that can take care of her. And at this point, I am choosing to be the one to be here. Now, if I really want to walk hand in hand with Hashem, I need to know that he could send any messenger at any time to watch Michal Levona and to have her taken care of, or for me to just put Michali down and let her continue sleeping or wake Malka up and Malka will continue taking care of her. It, it doesn't matter. Um, if like 
what, when I think that, that Hashem's possibilities and opportunities are infinite, then I am able to do what I really, really want. But when I think, why am I the only one and I'm resentful, then I feel a life, I, I live a life separated from Hashem, knowing that I'm not walking with him, feeling like I'm a victim. Like, so at two o'clock in the morning, I felt very tired and I decided to wake Malka up. Um, I woke her up. She felt very refreshed. She said, could you wait another 15, 20 minutes? I want to just pump. She pumped and I went home. And all of today, she was in the hospital. Either her friends came to visit her or she was by herself. Like she was by herself till three o'clock. And, um, and I know that Malka has the possibility of, of also being able to take care of herself. It's not me that has to do it for her all the time. And I want to be um, aware of that voice in me as to, to what extent I can give my tov, I can give my time, I can give my patience, I can give everything within me. And to what extent I'm going to back away and I'm going to let God handle it in a different way, not through me. That the, that God's abundance is, is, is not going to go through me. A lot of the time it does. It doesn't always have to. God has many other people that his abundance can go through. And that's like another lesson that I'm learning as we're going through this, um, you know, through this journey. It's it's such a journey. I find that we have all needed to grow. Mal Malka told me like, she feels like this, um, this, how do you say, like Nisayon, like Abraham had this test or this, you know, experience that she's going through. She feels like killed the innocence in her. Like she doesn't like this kind of innocence that life is amazing and everything's great. And like that kind of innocence is lost for her. I feel like I aged at least 10 to 20 years on this past month. It was so intensely experiential. I feel like, like this carefree, wholeheartedness person I used to be got pushed aside a little bit. She's still there, but something about me aged in, in many, many years. And part of my avoda is going to be to get, to, to, to be able to reach and connect to that carefree, happy person that I was and that's still there and to be able to bring her to the forefront. Anyway, any questions before I continue and really start the class? And we have an amazing class coming up. So I will put it on hold. If anyone has a question, please feel free. Pausing recording. Okay. okay. Now I want to teach today, what is geula? What does it mean? The redemption, geula, but a personal geula, not, not on a national level. We This class is always on a personal level. And I want to be able to touch it and to taste it. I want to touch and taste personal redemption. Now, I want to go back to Hanukkah and what did the Greeks want to do, right? They wanted, they the, the Greeks brought us into an exile. They brought us to a kind of a situation where they told us there's not one God, there are many gods. Yet when there are many gods, life is filled with anxiety. We don't have the one that we turn to. There's like, maybe we'll do this and maybe we'll do that. And maybe we'll ask this one or we'll ask that one. And, and that kind of scattering, that is an exile. That is not redemption. That's not certainty, right? At times in our lives, we feel like we're in darkness. We have anxiety. We have migraines. We have heaviness. We feel heaviness right? And we so much want to go out of that darkness into the light. It says that the Greek, and I've mentioned it before, they darkened the eyes of B'nai Israel. They, they, they try to convince us that there's no other way to live, but with a multiple of gods, like in other words, multiple of circumstances that are ruling our lives, right? And they try to convince us that there's no way out of the darkness. This is life. And that like life is difficult and hard and dark and depressing and filled with anxiety. This is what, and, and that there's no way, no way out. Now, we want to be able to taste what life is 
not in that darkness, but within redemption. However, it's a little bit difficult. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to do it because it's almost like a child that's born in prison. He has no concept of what freedom is. He never tasted it. He never experienced it. And it's almost like since we're born, there's been something programming us to, or we've lived in a world where um, we're being told that, you know, life is difficult. Life is hard. Life is um, anxiety ridden. Life is just, you know, one challenge after another that 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 is that is weighing down upon us. Now, I think part of the reason that that that, that happened is in order for our society to maintain itself as a consumeristic society, a lot of uh, the messages that we get is that you're lacking many things in life, and all you need to do to have a good life is just buy the right product, and then this lack will, you know, get taken care of, which ends up not being true because nothing physical will ever fill the lack that we have. The lack that we have is spiritual, but we've been, we, we've been told time and time and time again, like the, like, this is like really a parody of a, you know, a, a, a guy and a girl and they're going out and then she smells his breath and she's like, oh my God. And then he starts brushing with Colgate toothpaste. And then you see them coming down in Hawaii on their honeymoon as if buying Colgate is going to make your life perfect from all the things that are not. But so, so many of our lives, we've um, been programmed to believe just like this child is born in, in prison and doesn't know what um, light is, what freedom is, what life out of prison is. And, and we end up living life in darkness and negativity and anxiety and trying to placate those people around us. Now, when 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 I talk about doing drawers in our house, like opening up a drawer and take everything out and defining what the drawer is and only putting back what I love and what fits me and what looks good on me and what I need and what I use, right? Why am I doing that? I'm not doing that in order to get my house clean. I'm not doing that in order to make my environment pristine, even though it really is very, um, I mean, you know, you feel like when things are clean and neat and sorted, that it is a, a much more pleasant environment to live in. But we do it really so that we can meet ourselves, so we could get to know ourselves. Um, when I have a friend, let's say, and we were doing drawers together and she had a hard time. And this is all going to come back to how are we going to have Geula? How are we going to have redemption in our, in our lives? And when we took everything out and we defined the drawer and then we were starting to put things back, she realized about herself that she has a hard time letting go. And it's not only in the drawer, it's letting go of everything, letting go of her child that's little, um, letting go of you know the, the the kind of husband that she used to have we're all constantly dynamically changing but she had a hard time with her husband changing her husband um she had a hard time letting go of the guy she married 30 years ago but we've all been changing so so what she learned about herself as she did the draw is that she has a hard time relinquishing letting go we try to do the draws so that we could learn about ourselves in any given situation. And when I'm, I meet myself, right? When I open the drawer and I do it and I meet myself in any given situation, I meet God alongside of me. Because when she met herself in the fact that she's having a hard time relinquishing, <clears throat> she could then hold on to God's hands and say, I discovered about myself that I have a hard time letting go because I'm scared that, I might need it one day because I'm scared that, you know, I won't have money and then I'm not gonna be able to afford it because I'm, I'm just scared. So she learned about herself that she lives life in fear and it's, it's an opportunity to turn our eyes to Hashem and pray about it and ask him, I don't want to live in fear. I want to be able to trust in you. I want to be able to know that you're in charge of everything that happens in my life. And this is my path. And, and I don't want fear to be part of my existence now the husband that i have the children i have the parents i have and the friends i have those are just triggers for me to get to know myself better so that we can get closer to god 
Um, and, and we need to realize every time we have an interaction with an interaction that annoys us, that bothers us, that triggers us, that depresses us, right? Every time we have an interaction, we, we, we need to realize that it's a trigger for me to get to know myself better. So, so if we can just get closer to God after the event, after we realize what it is that it says about me, then we will be healed. A woman who's able to stand before a drawer is one that's willing to meet all the unnecessary things in her life and to relinquish it. We go around life in the physical with many, many things that are not necessary. But now I those really reflect what we go through life in the spiritual sense of things that are not necessary. And when I mean not necessary, I mean unnecessary thoughts, unnecessary words, and unnecessary actions. And I'm going to give myself as an example, like unnecessary thoughts about what's going to be with Michal and in the future. And, and you know, is this doctor's prediction going to be right? Is that doctor? Like, these are just unnecessary thoughts that I carry around in myself. And they teach me about myself that I try to have control over my environment. Now, there's also unnecessary words where I will, I could talk it through. I could just talk it out. And it's just a barrage and really almost like a hemorrhage of words that are not necessary, that don't do any good. And there are also unnecessary actions of, I'm going to go back to my situation with Michal, of like, just feeling like I constantly have to do in doing mode in order to calm myself. So it would be more of creating a bond with God if I could learn how to calm myself, not through so much actions, but also through the ability to realize that he's running the world and things are going according to what he wants. And that at the end of the day, He's giving us exactly what we need in order to grow. Now, I want to give a couple of rules on how do we deal with the darkness that occasionally meets us in our lives. Okay, I'm giving you a three-pointer of how we will be doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's how to deal with the darkness and how to bring God into our how to bring his light into the darkness so that we will not be living in this prison any longer. Okay. So when any given situation occurs, we need to say the facts and the facts only, not all the interpretations, but only, only the facts. I want to give an example. I have my son, Shalomo, who um, like a week ago, I had a brilliant idea. In Malka's house, Malka lives in like a 60-year-old tenement from, you know, the days that the state of Israel was made, was, was created. And these tenements used to be, belonged to like um, the staff of a school, a high school was run over there in Pardes Khana, a very well-known high school in Israel that closed down. And the staff's quarters was now rented out by the school officials you know, for many, many years, it's been rented out since the school closed. And um, the apartments are very run down. Now, already a half a year ago, I was thinking to myself that I'd like to take like a week or two and help renovate the apartment. Like just put like um, um, a shower doors instead of curtains and and to like cut all the trellises on the the side of the house because all the pigeons are there and it's gross and um and to like put parquet on the floors it just all these little touches that make a huge difference and when i, I so, so i said you know after Malk has the baby and i had a big bar mitzvah coming up once both those things happen i'm going to take a week or two and i'm going to do it anyway right before the bar mitzvah ended i found out about michael Halal. i had a great idea i was going to tell my son shalomo do the um construct like do what needs to be done and I'll pay you so uh, before he did it um because he's in between dreams he um he said you know I'm only willing to do it if if or is going to say that it's okay now or is in a place where 
he just wants to be with his daughter. He doesn't want anyone doing anything around him. And he hates the fact that people are treating him like a Hazi case. He said, no one that doesn't have a child that has cancer, doesn't know how to feel. I just want to be with parents whose kids have cancer. And anyone that tells me anything, they don't even know what they're talking about. They have no clue of how I'm feeling. And he hates the fact that people are cooking for them or watching his kids or whatever it is that they're doing. Like he feels like everyone thinks he's a Hazi case and he's not. So on the phone with me and Shalama, he said, I am not, you know, I, I don't want you to do this and don't do that. And it's not the time. And so then Shalama said, I'm sorry, under these circumstances, I'm, I, I don't want to do any renovations in the house. It doesn't sound like he wants it. And um, which would have actually been the perfect time to do it because the kids were all by me or in Mako or in the hospital with the baby, like the house was empty. It would have been perfect. And instead, he went on a trip down south with his friends. So now I could have, the, what is the fact here? The fact is I wanted to renovate the house. Shlomo spoke to all and decided not to, and he went on a trip. Those are the facts, right? Now, many people, when they tell the story, they could go into, and he just left us all here. Everyone is doing everything. He's taking a trip. Um, he's only thinking about himself. He's not interested in what and so what, or is not 100% agreeing, but just do it. And then he's going to love it afterwards because the apartment really needs to be renovated. Really, really. Um, and and I could go on and on, like um, um, interpreting what happens and giving and embellishing. And I would be thinking that it's all true, but really when we are faced with a situation, we really need to say only the facts. This, this I want to say, if we want Geula in our lives, if we want redemption in our lives, we will just say the facts. I asked Shlomo to renovate. He spoke to Or. Or said no. Shlomo went on a trip. Those are the facts. Without, you know, those are the facts. Um, I want to give another example of um, a friend of mine who got married to a guy that has a son from a previous marriage and they also have two, three children. And uh, she very much wanted all the kids to light Hanukkah candles together. She asked the mother, you know, her husband's ex-wife, if um, uh, she, you know, if she could drop the son off on Wednesday on Hanukkah so that they could all light together. The mother said yes. And the mother, and, and so my friend created like a beautiful evening and toys and games and blah, blah, blah. And the mother never dropped the child off. Okay. Now, what are the facts? The facts is I invited my husband's child. I asked the mother to bring him. The mother said yes, and the mother didn't show up. Okay. Now, everything else are, is interpretations. She is a liar. She never stands by her words. She says one thing and does the other thing. She always is disappointing us. She doesn't like to. She doesn't like the fact that I married her husband, and that's why she's sticking it to me. She doesn't want her son to be with our children. All that are interpretations. We need to stop with these sentences that are not necessary. When we take out all the unnecessary things out of our home, out of our drawers, this these are the unnecessary um, talks that we have in our minds, in our heads. These are the unnecessary. Um, um, baggage that we hemorrhage about. So without emotions, without tones, no extraneous interpretations, say the facts. What do I see here? Right? What do we call that? We call that God doesn't work for me in this world. God did something unexpected. Uh, my son went on the trip. This son didn't show up. Right? No, this is not according to my plan. I had my other plan of renovations. She had her plan of Hanukkah party, right? And when something like that happens, we go off the deep end in a constant hemorrhage of not saying the facts, but complaining about. It's like almost like, God, what you gave me, I'm not happy with, and I'm going to incessantly complain about it. And I'm going to complain about the fact that, that you don't work for me, but really we're the ones that are working for him, right? Now, when a darkness occurs, and it occurs when we start interpreting and railing against the facts of reality, right? It's um, it, it it immediately creates in me like a depression, 
uh, railing about it because I, I don't agree with God, what, what God did. Like we're trying to tell God, you know, please run the word differently. Make my son do the renovations and make uh, her bring her son over there so that we could have a whole Hanukkah party, et cetera, et cetera. Right. It's the other way around. We're supposed to be worshiping Hashem and Hashem is not worshiping us. Okay. So the first step at any given situation, we need to say the facts, facts. Okay. And I want to say, I want to tell you, this is the hardest thing to do because we put so much unnecessary um, interpretations into everything because we try to convince everyone around us that the way we see it is the right way. But most of what we say are interpretations. And, and the interpretations is what makes us feel miserable. Oh, I want to say, I want to, I want to um, bring an example from my life. My father, in our relationship, usually, he's very busy. He's a rabbi and he has rabbis all over the world and he has different leadership programs and different Israeli programs. He's one of the busiest people I know. He does so much. But he made it a point, he called me up every single day, like throughout the past couple of years, like for years and years, he calls me every single day. Since Michal Levona became sick, he stopped calling me. Now, what are the facts? The facts are, my father called me every single day. Michal Levona got sick, my father stopped calling me. Those are the facts without any embellishment. Now, I can start taking this into many different situations. Like, could you believe now that I really need him? He's not calling me. He doesn't care. He, he It's too much for him. It's this, it's that. No, this is the fact. This is the fact. And everything else that I would say about it is unnecessary. Unnecessary as if you are collecting garbage in your house and living with it and living with it. And we don't want to live with garbage in our house. We're trying to clear our house of garbage. We're trying to clear our house of the unnecessary. Now, because I'm very close to my father, I know that he loves me very much. And when I'm in pain, it's too hard for him to bear. And, and um, even that is an interpretation. But I want to say that the fact that he doesn't call didn't make me feel bad, didn't make me feel resentful, didn't make me feel victimized or anything like that. I knew that there is there's a reason for it. And that reason has God in it. And, and I didn't even ask my father, like, dad, why aren't you calling? But I know that it's so hard for my father to see his children in pain. He'd rather not be exposed to it. And he's thinking to himself, most probably, if she needs me, she's going to call. But I know that he's protecting and shielding himself from any kind of pain. Um, okay. So, so um, God doesn't work for us, as I say. And and this, the fact that my father doesn't call me. Okay, wait, that, that's already the second step. Okay. Michal? Yeah. Hi. Isn't that also, like you, you were saying how you can't, you know, how you can, um, I mean, from what I'm understanding, kind wait, of like spin. Tell me who's talking. Hi, it's Lori. It's Lori. Uh, hi, Lori. Yeah. Go ahead. So from what I'm understanding, mm -hmm. before you were saying like you had, with the person that the, the Hanukkah, whatever it was like, you, you don't want to. You don't want to like kind of create your own narrative because you, you 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 don't know what's going on. That's your interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. So isn't this whole thing with your father your interpretation also? Also, what is the fact? The fact is that since Michal Levonah got sick, I didn't get a phone call from my father. But maybe he, maybe he, like, who knows? Maybe he's in China. How, how do we know? Like, how do you know what's, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's your oh, interpretation. I, and, I know, and I know my father's in Israel. I know my father. No, but I'm saying the fact that... But it's still oh, your why. yes. Even the why, what I said that my father's in a lot of pain and da da da. That is my interpretation. I want us to stay only in the fact my father has not called me since. Um, my father hasn't called since. Um, Michal when I got sick. That's a fact. That's it. Right. I anything else is extraneous. Is is extraneous luggage, and I don't want to have that part of my life. I don't want to have that. Okay. Because in a minute, you're going to see why that's not walking with God. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Great. Um, okay. Now, um, the second step is the second step is what after, after we have the first step, 
the second, what do I find out about myself in the automatic? Like automatically, in the automatic, what happens when I see a situation that triggers me? Automatically, I say something negative about the other person. What usually happens is I say something negative about the situation, right? Let's say I, uh, the, my friend said something negative about the woman who didn't bring the child, right? Um, also, a, a, another example, a woman in our class that her father was a very old time kibbutz member, right? And uh, her father actually built the kibbutz and um, like built the agriculture over there and created the kibbutz to be a huge success where the kibbutzim were losing their money left, right, and center. And her father became sick, like a terminal illness. And the father said, I would like to stay in the kibbutz. I don't want to leave. But the mother found that she wasn't getting the support and medical attention and, you know, support. In other words, um, the people, enough people to take care of the father to her liking. And the mother started to make preparations to take the father out of the kibbutz, to move out of the kibbutz. And my friend, whose mother was doing that, um, she was so triggered by it okay and and at that point when we're triggered instead of focusing on the other person and what the person did we want to take a step inwards and say what does this teach what am i finding out about myself what am i finding out about herself and what she found out is that she has a lot of things negative to say about her mother even before this whole kibbutz incident this kibbutz incident just took it to another level of saying negative things about her mother. But from much before, she had many negative things to say about her mother. So, so, and usually I want to say, like, let's say when our husbands does something and we we interpret it in 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 a way, you know, we we say we don't we veer from the facts and we start interpreting it, you know, because he really is not considerate and because he really doesn't care and he doesn't see blah blah, all that we need to realize that it's not because our husband just now did something that we're talking about him in this negative way. We have been speaking about him negatively for, for years. For years, we don't have a lot of good things to say about our husbands, which is why at this point, we could continue doing that. But with this, but so we need to find out when um, when we have the, the, the this trigger, that are, what is our automatic response? And when we find out the automatic response, we'll find out a lot about ourselves. Now, this woman, what did she find out? She found out the woman with the keyboards. She found out that um, uh, that she has a lot of negativity towards her mother. And two, that when someone does something that she's not happy with, she's not willing to accept it. Inability to accept something that, that someone does that she doesn't agree with. Okay, that, that's what she found out about herself. Now, why is it important to find out those things about ourselves? First of all, because uh, instead of now trying to convince her mother that she's not doing the right thing, that her father wants to stay in the kibbutz and she has to leave the father in the kibbutz and she is going to start dealing with herself, with the fact that she can't hear and know that things always have to go her way. She has to start dealing with the fact that in her head, she does not have positive things to say about her mother and she will need to start changing all these things. It's not about her mother leaving the father in the kibbutz or not leaving the father in the kibbutz. It's about her being able to hear a no, to give kavod to her mother, to bring God into the situation that we're going to talk about in one minute, how we do that. I want to just share another story of a friend of mine called Yabden, whose family is very wealthy. And her father takes her all her like 10 siblings with their each one of their, you know, um, children, all the grandchildren. He takes them every Hanukkah away to somewhere in Israel, and they have they spend eight days together in like a beautiful um, resort in Israel. Now, they on the fourth day of Hanukkah, she read in the paper that there's like a um, a show happening, and um, and she wanted to go and take her children, but her father said, "You know what, Dad?" Dad? we did so much today. I don't think it's necessary. Let's, let's just stay in the hotel. However, yeah, then sister who also saw that the show was happening immediately bought tickets and took her kids. And, and 
as she was at the show, she kept on sending videos like, oh my God, look what's happening. And this is what they're doing. It's so amazing. And my kids are loving it, right? And she found herself looking at these pictures the whole time and, and was very triggered about it. Now, at this point, when we're triggered, we need to turn inwards and say, what does this teach me about myself? And what it taught her about herself in her automatic that she, in life, not only in this situation, that she's always feeling like she's missing out, right? Not only here, but at all times. It's, it's, like, it's like a bigger picture. Things that trigger us show us a bigger picture about ourselves, right? And, um, and at this, and, and at this moment, it's not about her father or her sister or wrong decision she made. It's about finding out about herself and praying to God, please help me be happy wherever I am, no matter where I am, because it doesn't, it, it, it really is not about what I'm doing at all times. It's where that it's, it's the knowledge that I am exactly where I need to be. This is where God wants me to be and that my happiness is not dependent on me being at the show or not being at the show, going or not going. I could be happy anywhere Hashem puts me, right? Where I am is where I need to be and where I can be happy and where I could hold you, God's hand, right? So one of the arguments in this world, like when we become triggered and we're unhappy and when we see things around us that, that, that depress us or upset us or whatever, is, is this world being run according to the way I want it to be run or according to the way he is running it? So if I'm sad, depressed, or triggered, then, then I'm not there. I'm not there. I'm not there with God because I'm telling God, you're, you're not doing such a great job. Okay. Now, the third thing is after I see what I do in the automatic, right? Um, I ask myself, what type of person am I, right? What type of person am I? I need to know what type of person I am. And I'll give another example. Um, there's someone in Michal's class that her husband is an F-16 fighter pilot. And he's also, which is very rare in the Israeli army, he's also a rabbi. And they're at the head of a moshav called Michalim. And um, and the husband is, it was like in the Antebi raid. And he also was one of the pilots that blew up the Iraqi, um, or the Iraqi nuclear reactor. And, um, and, and he's a rabbi. And her son, her youngest son, decided to like, do take off his kippah and do a mohawk and she was very very triggered by it right so the first thing is you know the first step we say you know we just want to hear the, the facts the fact is he decided that he wants a mohawk and and with the mohawk he doesn't want to put a kippah on that's that those are the facts but instead she goes on and on and, and he doesn't care and he is doing it to aggravate me and he's doing it to rebel and he's doing it because he wants to be different. Like, okay. Now, what did she, oh, and, 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 and so we have these embellishments and then immediately she's talking bad about him. And then um, now the question to ask herself is what is this teaching her about herself, right? What, what, what did she get to know about herself? And she got to know about herself that it's really important to her what people are going to think. And it's like, how could the son of, you know, my father who is, who was a rabbi and his father, who was a fighter pilot and a rabbi walking around with a mohawk, you know, and, and she realized that what people are going to think is more important for her than anything else. Just like um, the woman that didn't want her father moved from the kibbutz found out about herself, that there's no option. Someone else is going to do what she doesn't want them to do. Now, just being aware of that fact is a huge step forward, right? The, um, and from this point on, we need to figure out how to make God knows, right? How, how to make God known in this darkness. So when I meet this darkness is an opportunity for me to let God shine through me, right? Why did my husband give me the husband he gave me, the children he gave me? So we could shine a light through all the moments of darkness. And in the, in, in, in the minute that we shine that light, that's the time that we get to meet him. When I say shine the light in the darkness, I mean shine a light through my aggravation, my stress, my stress, my expectations of those around me, my depression, right? 
Um, so how do we bring God into this equation? The way we bring God into this equation is to build a fence, to build a gader around me. And once I build that fence around me, I can decide how I want myself to be defined. How will I characterize myself in the situation? The fence is to delineate my separateness from all those around me. Separate separation. I was telling my sister Malori that I found myself whenever Malka was um, having a hard day or sad, I find myself, I, I would plummet with her. And that's because I didn't have a fence. I didn't have a fence around me. And I wasn't, I wasn't um, defining who I was as a mother to Malka. What help would it be if when Malka is depressed, I will also feel down and upset and depressed. Like, like my daughter's sinking in quicksand and I'm like ripping my fence of differentiation between her and me and jumping into the quicksand with her when I get depressed because she is having a bad day. So my first wound is we need to build a, a fence of separateness from all those around me, right? And then I want to ask myself, how do I define myself? Example, so this is a great example. I have a, a far off friend, we're not, not very close, but when this happened to her, so she 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 turned to me and we were trying to work a little bit together. So she her um father had a small business that was quite lucrative. I mean, they, they were all very comfortable. This is before she was married. Um, I had a small of of at the beginning of the beginning when when they just started to build drones, and um, and he he was trying to get the drones to be used by the Israeli army. Now he had a couple of sons, and none of his sons were interested in the business. And then my my friend met a guy who was very technologically minded and did very well in the army, like had a lot of connections in the army. And when she married him. The father saw this guy and he said, you know what? I want to bring you into the family business. None of my sons are interested. And you look like you know what you're doing and you have connections in the army. And I'd love the army to start using my drones. And why don't you, um, you know, come in and join the business? So my friend's husband, who was very young, just said, yeah, great. I'd like to. And together with the father, he started like expanding the business. and because the father had a lot of experience and he had connections in the army. So they were able to win a couple of bids in the army. The army started using their drones and, and it really took off because the army wanted to start, um, instead of using like live pilots, live, th they wanted to use the drones to take pictures, to even have ammunition in the drones. Like it was very cutting edge. Fast forward 20 years, um, the, 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 my friend, her name is Yocheved, um, and her husband, his name, his name is Ori. So Ori, they were they were making loads and loads of money, and all the brothers and sisters were living on that money. But Yocheved and Ori didn't mind at all because because they realized that the father gave them opportunity, and and what did they care anyway? Like everyone just had a lot. But what happened with COVID? And right after COVID, the Israeli government was, we, we went into elections many times and things in the, in the defense ministry in Israel changed. And the guy, Ori, was not on top of, of, of you know, all the, um, the contracts that he had. And they were cutting because of COVID, like a lot of funding went into COVID, it didn't go into defense they cut down on things and they cut him down to such an extent that literally the business went crashing down. And it was, and it was a lot due to his being not mismanaging, but being very, um, not, not holding it on and not being so aware that things are changing. And because he wasn't aware things were changing, they, they lost everything. Now, um, When that happened, everyone in the family was angry with him and upset with him. Her father had already passed away, um, but 
it, forget that everyone was upset and angry and everyone had to like sell their homes, lifestyle totally went down the hill from what they were ever used to. Um, and at, at, at a certain point, like they, they, everyone realized that, you know, if they wanted things to continue, they needed to get into the business and there's nothing to blame him for. But it didn't even matter because he blamed himself more than anyone. And he went into a depression and he started to, he didn't get out of bed. And he just started to play. Um, in Israel, they play on soccer, like they 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 gamble on soccer, on games. And he would start going, to, that was the only thing that, that he, he would do to make him happy, go to soccer games and bet on it. Now, um, his, the, the problem was that his, his wife felt his pain so keenly, felt his depression, was worried about it. And, and it, it, she went down with him. Like she also um, was not, lost her whole Simchat Chaim, was not able to function, had to pull herself out of bed every day also. Now, if she had a fence around her, and the first thing is to build that fence around her, to delineate that separateness from those around her. And the question that she would have to ask herself is, what is my definition as a wife, right? As a wife. So first of all, as a wife, my definition is not, if I want to put in the definition drawer to worry, as a wife, is that what I want to do? Worry is a definition that I want to put in the drawer? No, it's not something I want to put in the drawer. So it's something that I will not do because the truth is if I put worry in it, it's not because of this current situation. It's because worry was a part of my life for many years. And now I choose to highlight it even more. What I want to put in the drawer as a, of a wife, of a mother, of a grandmother drawer, right? What I want to put into it is not worry, but it's more he'arat panim. He'arat panim means to be able to have a shining face when I see my husband, when I see my children, when I see, now let's talk as a wife because I'm talking about Yochavet and Ori. So <clears throat> instead of, oh, you know what? I, I'm leaving them aside first and I'm going to come back to them. But I want to go back to the Greek. <clears throat> Something really interesting. Um. What is a fence? So, right, I, I keep on saying, let's put on the gadet, the gadet. But what is a fence? When the Greeks came to capture Jerusalem, right, they broke the wall and they broke the wall around Jerusalem in 13 places. They they hacked through and that's and that's where their, their forces went in and they captured and they, you know, and, and they took over. Now, when they left the land, when the Maccabim came and the Greek left, of course, they fixed those 13 places in the wall, in the wall. And there was a halakha at that time, after they left the land and the holes were patched, that anyone that passed down, that passed those fixed holes, he needed to bow down to the floor, as we do on Yom Kippur, to totally prostrate himself before these cracks. Now, when, when we bow down on Yom Kippur, that kind of bowing down of our whole body, not like we do in Aleinu, right? What are we basically saying? We're saying, I give myself up to you because there are two things that we have that an animal doesn't have. We have the ability to stand tall and upright and we have an ability to present a shining face to the other. In my wife's drawer, I will say one of the highest things I want to put in the drawer, I'll say the first thing I want to put in that wife drawer is to show my husband a shining countenance, a happy face. That's my description as a wife, happy, shining face. Not to ask questions. When are you coming? When are you going? What did you do? How are you going to do? What did you eat? Et cetera. No, I just want to show, hi, how are you? That's it. And God bless you. I want to have in the draw the, my ability to bless my husband. May God give you strength. May God give you happiness. May God give you, may God bless everything that you do, right? So two steps, a shining face and the ability to, 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 to bless. And my ability to bow down when, you know, as they said that, you know, when they bowed down into all those places in the wall that were fixed. So I thank God for my very existence. And just the fact that I exist, that bowing down, um, it, 
it it represents the fact that everything in my life is frills. Everything in my life is like my friend Yudit. Okay, there's no more like the, the the defense ministry is out. They're not using their drones. They took someone else's drones. They decided to cut down on drones. There no more vacation. No more this. No more that. No more. The fact that we exist is 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 just for that we need to thank God. And when I bow down, I I'm saying that I'm putting myself aside for God's plans for me, right? It's like it's like um we have the pizza and then we have the topping. The pizza is my very existence, and I thank God for my very existence. And that's why we need to bow down in front of the crack every time we went by, because we don't we want to have the fence upright. So that God could be in our lives. And we are, when we build the fence around us, we affirm God's place in our lives. We say, God, you know what you're doing. Like Yochaved was saying, like when she builds the face around, this is what we needed to go through. This is what my husband needed to go through. Uh, I want to be able to see God in everything we do. I want to know that I could be happy regardless of, yes, having a vacation, no having a vacation. Yes, having my big house, no having my big house. Uh, yes, my child is not going to be able to go to the camp that I always sent him to, but I can still be grateful and happy and realize that this is God's plan for me. God's not going to work according to my plan for him. He's we're, we're, he's working according to his plan for me, and I want to go according to it. Now, not having a fence in psychological terms means that we're enmeshed. We're enmeshed um, with with the other, but being enmeshed with the other means that we are not respecting the individual and the individuality that Hashem made that person into. Like we are diving into with the person, being depressed with him, trying to make him happy, trying to make things better. It's it's not for us to do it. It's for him to walk with God and do it. And 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 the only thing we could do is walk with God and do it with ourselves. Um okay. Oh, hold on a minute. Okay. Um, okay, I think I'm going to stop here. And um, uh, I want to know if anyone has questions as to what I, to, to as we, what we just, what we just learned. But wait, one more thing. Wait, I don't know why this, hold on one second. Okay. Oh, there, there we go. One minute. Um. Oh, okay. One more thing. I very important. I'm glad I didn't stop. Um. What is this fence? What is this gadel? Very important. So please continue listening. The gadel is the ability to look at the other and see God and see the word kavod in front of my eyes. It takes from me the ability to want anything from my husband to talk about him to expect from him from my children from my parents right because when i build the fence around me and i look out of my fence the only thing i want to see is god is kavod is respect in front of my eyes right so before i talk to anyone in front of me i must see god so when i create a fence it creates honesty and it creates a clean slate between me and the other because i have nothing to say about him anymore Right. So. So. Any kind of relationship I create, if I don't say anything about the other. Right. If I don't say anything about him, like Yochaved was saying about Ori, he's just wasting his life and he's depressed and he's disappointed at himself. And he's like all all these interpretations. Right. If you don't say any of those things about. The other but just have a deep knowledge that everyone has a life's journey and they choose it. And we need to give kavod for that choice. And so the fence helps to protect us, to be able to look out of our fence to someone else and just see God over there, just see Hashem. And those are the three different steps that I said that I feel like if we take it, we could walk hand in hand with God. Okay.